a little bit. Type of register. Oh, there we go. Got it. So types of register accounts. That's the tax free savings, the register retirement savings plan, the register education savings plan. These are all different uh, tools essentially given by the government to help encourage savings in different ways with different tax benefits. Well, you wanna start there? So with regards to the tax free savings, what is a tax free saving? Well, you can see here that we've, um, it's really a government approved account that provides tax benefits to Canadians for saving. So we're going to go over why you would have a tax-free savings. And one of the largest parts of financial planning is all about both your short and long-term goals and how to plan for those, the best ways. So for example, the, ta the tax-free savings, it's a tool, like I said, that can be used. Be used for a down payment on your first home, a dream home one day after you even have your first home, a vacation. Uh, emergency savings, estate planning, and retirement. There's other things, of course, that can be added to that. These are just some examples. Um, so the big benefit, maybe you want to touch on this one alone as well? So one of the largest benefits would be, I mean, it, it states it, uh, is that it's tax efficiency. So anybody that is looking to have a little bit of savings and also have it you know grow short term or long term the the growth so the interest potentially earned um, when you're looking um, at saving it it's also remains tax tax protected within that tax free savings as well so normally if you just had money invested you would be paying tax on that money uh so say you made let's just for example say you made 500 dollars one year on your investment uh that money that 500 dollars become taxable income and you'd probably pay somewhere between it depends on where you're at but let's for example 20 percent on that right so you're instantly losing money in that sense to the government this is a tool that they've given you to say hey we want you to invest your money we want you to save your money for something that's important to you and this is how you can do it without having to worry about us taking a piece of it there's one aspect in here uh where we put estate planning and some of you might be asking how is this an estate planning tool um with the tax-free savings you're able to list a beneficiary and that means that instead of it having to go to the court system and go through probate you can have it whatever money you have in this tax-free savings, pass on to one of your loved ones or whoever you might name as a beneficiary. Uh, with just, just as soon as you pass, uh, it can go right to that person without the, the extra work and the potential costs of the estate. So when can you contribute to a TFSA? So, uh, a TFSA, a tax-free savings. So as soon as you turn 18 years of age, you can start contributing to a tax-free savings. Um, that contribution room accumulates year after year. So even if you didn't contribute right when you turned 18, the room will continue to build on itself and then you'll have that for when you're able to contribute down the road. With that tax-free savings, let's say that you withdrew some of the money so maybe you you deposited uh, maybe you deposited this five thousand dollars in two thousand and nine, and then you took that out two years later. You don't actually lose that contribution room. You'll get that contribution room back the following year. So in this example, you had five thousand dollars, and then let's say you got another five thousand the next year. When you withdraw that. In the third year, you'll get another five thousand dollars a room plus that five thousand you had. So you still have the ability to deposit fifteen thousand into a tax free savings in two thousand eleven. So the beauty of that is that we talked about how this is a savings tool and that how you can use it for short term goals as well as long. 
you don't have to worry about losing the contribution room if you've actually taken the money out of it, which sometimes is a common misconception that people have. Uh, so your lifetime contribution room as of right now, if you've been a Canadian citizen since 2009, is $75,500 worth of room. Generally, lots of room for someone to use for their tools for whatever their goals are. Um, now, I do have a question if anyone wants to, to have um, to answer the question. If you were to, let's say, withdraw from your tax free savings account, does anybody know what the tax implication would be if you were to withdraw any dollar amount from the tax free account? Would you have to pay tax on it then for that year? That's a very good question. Do you do you pay tax on it if you were to withdraw it? Yes. <laughs> I know nothing. No, no, no. I thank you for, for participating. And that's part of it is it's just wanting to make sure that, you know, any questions and misconceptions um, with regards to what it is that we're talking about. It was a trick question. Um, and no, it, it, it almost sounds good, to, too good to be true. When the name tax-free savings account came out, it, it almost sounds too good to be true, but it, it's true. So if you were looking to withdraw funds from your tax-free savings account, whatever that dollar amount may be, it's tax-free. Yeah, it's not just that you're not being taxed on the money while you're earning money within that savings account. You're actually not going to have any tax at all, even at the end when you do take it out. So it's a great tool for that. And a nice thing about it as well, in the future, if you were to, let's say, have your tax-free um, monies accumulate over a period of time and you get into your retirement years, it doesn't impact your uh, um, old age security pensions or CPP pensions because it's not considered income. There's lots of benefits that the government will give to you if you're lower income. And if you are using, say, an, an RSP, a registered retirement savings plan, when you take money out of that, you'd be considered income. And that might actually take away from some of those benefits because your income bracket has gone up. So that is why this, this can be used to, to really help in that scenario too. And there's no fees or any penalty at all for taking money in and out, no? No, well, there isn't in general, but you have to, well, I guess how we should explain this. With the tax-free savings, I always like to compare it to this, this big umbrella Okay, just underneath this tax-free savings, you can have all sorts of different investments. You could have a term deposit, you could have a mutual fund, you could have a stock or a bond, many different types of investments that are out there that are available in different scenarios. And the tax-free savings itself is not going to have any penalties or fees or anything like that for taking in and out of it. No withholding taxes because again, it's tax-free, no tax implication on it. Specifically, there is no tax implication for, with, for the tax savings account. Depending upon the type of investment that you have. So like John has said, if you had, let's say, a type of investment where um, it had a maturity date and before it came to maturity, um, some, sometimes you may have a um, implication in terms of breaking that particular investment. Um, term contract. The tax-free account itself, within the tax-free account, you can invest it to different types of investments. I hope that brings a little clarity. Does that bring a little clarity or are there more questions you can ask? So essentially with that scenario, it's if you're working with an advisor, you just want to fine tune which product works best for you to invest in and that will have the rules around it. So how to contribute to a tax-free savings. That brings us back to that round. Uh, what we're just kind of talking about, working with an investor, uh, advisor at any different financial institution. Um, so how to contribute to a tax-free savings? Um, well, first you want to make sure that you know what your contribution is. 
As you can see here, some of those um, ways that you can determine is through the online MyCRA account for anybody that may have a, an account set up with My Online CRA, or you can call Canada Revenue Agency directly. Some of you may have a bookkeeper or an accountant that you may work with. That's another way to um, possibly determine um, through your accountant what your contribution form may be. If you've never contributed to a tax free savings, um, as mentioned earlier, John had said that um, as of 2021, the maximum contribution limit for a tax free savings is 75,500. And uh, you know, with each um, year, that, that amount accumulates. So as of 2022, CRA announced the new contribution for 2022 is 6,000. So 6,000 in addition to the $75,500. Now, once you determine what your contribution room is, visit your, your local financial institution and speak with your designated advisor to find out one um, setting, what it would um, take to set up your tax-free account. And then from there, within the tax free savings, determining your, your goals um, and the type of investment that best suits your goals and needs. When you do set up your tax free savings account, typically you'll have to have or you'll need a bank account, your social insurance number, as well as your date of birth. And of course, you have to be minimum age of majority, 18 years or older. There are also self direct investing options. So through the self-direct investing options, you can set up an online account. Um, typically, again, you would need to know your social insurance number and also typically require your banking information. Any questions around? The biggest thing on that as well is if you're talking to a financial advisor about it, and that's it should be anyone, any one of your advisors at any institution that should be able to give you advice on it. It's it's based off residency of Canadian citizenship. So even if you're having a hard time calling the Canadian Revenue Agency or getting on MyCRA, we can usually get a pretty good idea if you're gonna have some contribution or not. It's just the amount that might differ. And that's sometimes when you gotta fine tune it. But for starting this off, if you come on in and you wanna open it up, I, I'd hope an advisor will be able to help you out and figure some of that out. Getting into RRSPs or Register Retirement Savings Plans. So this is just a government approved investment to help Canadians save money for retirement. So, and, and even more, it's an investment vehicle really. So same thing as the tax-free savings. With this, another big umbrella, you can invest in all those same categories. So that's term deposits, uh, just regular savings accounts, mutual funds, stocks, and bonds. And the government's given you this tool to actually uh, encourage you, well, actually it'll be on the next slide, but it's to encourage your retirement and to help fund it for those of us that don't have pension plans um, or any, any other employer benefit type of plan like that. So John's touched a little bit on why you would have an RSP, specifically one of the main purposes is to save your retirement. And some of those benefits to the RSP include having a retirement income as you segue into your retirement years. But another, another big piece of the RSP is that you can use it as a tax deferral tool. So what does that mean when we talk about tax deferral? Well, as you go out um, and you work for a living and you have your career and so forth, no one has ever said, I, I want to pay more taxes. So in that instance where you have your RSP, this is a way to postpone and minimize taxes paid on income earned. You can also use your, your RSP as a tool to, you know, as a first time home buyer and use it as a down payment for your first home purchase. You can also use it to help fund your post-secondary education. And also, as we start to talk about investments um, within the RSP, it, it has a tax deferred compound interest as well. There's a lot of bigger components to that one. I wonder if anyone has any questions about it. Um, well, hearing what you've presented so far, I'm wondering what would be the advantage of 
an RRSP as opposed to a tax-free savings? Like, why would you choose one over the other? So it's very situationally based. Um, and it, got, it, it becomes a bit more, uh, it becomes a bigger question because it's really a get to know you situation. One thing that you have to understand or we have to understand about our members is where their income is at now and where it's gonna be in the future. So one of the big reasons to use an RSP is if you're making a higher income, that's actually got you in a, a higher tax bracket where you're paying more on tax money on, on the money you're making now, then you most likely will in retirement when you're gonna be on a limited government pension income and maybe this RSP, maybe even a pension plan, but it, it still might be less than you're making at this point in time. That's when that RSP becomes really beneficial. And it's like, you take the advantage of being able to put money into an investment now, defer taxes on the money that you're throwing into that investment. And then when you take it out down the road, you're actually gonna pay tax on that money. But you might be making you know, a, a significant amount less money than you were at the time that puts you in a lower tax bracket and that could change uh, you know, you from, from 30% taxes to 20% taxes, for example. So not only are you able to invest tax-deferred money, so invest more money now, essentially, um, for a long period and get growth on that money that you're not paying tax on year after year, you're also, when you are eventually going to take that money out, you're going to pay tax on it and hopefully be at a lower tax bracket. So you're saving money in that sense too. For the tax-free savings, as far as why you might pick that one over the TF or over the RSP, it, it, like I said, it is a bit more of a situational thing. You have to do a bit of analysis with it. Uh, but say you're not getting as much of a tax benefit on the tax deferred growth, but you want to be able to put money in to save for say a short-term goal, something that's five years out. Um, and you wanna take that money out without having to worry about any tax consequences. That's, what, that's one example of when you might wanna use a tax for savings versus an RRSP. I just, I just thought it was well, David, thank you for the question. Now, nothing says you have to have an RSP or a TFSA. Uh, for myself, for example, I have both. So in the instance for the tax free savings itself, uh, I, 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 you know, would like to, to put money into my tax free savings account, keeping in mind that because I have both in the, you know, if, if my accountant says, you know what, Leah, you, you also need to make an RSP contribution this year. What I have the ability to be able to, to do is take money from my tax free savings and draw it and transfer it to the RSP. So John is definitely on point when he talks about it. It really depends on circumstances in terms of your short-term goals and your long-term goals, um, wants and needs. And you know, here at Island Savings, we really hone in on those, those um, short-term, long-term goals, wants and needs, which really help determine what's going to be best for you in your situation and circumstances. I hope that answers your question. Uh, and also, I mean, you're only allowed, you, you can only contribute kind of a small amount to tax-free savings, can't you? Like you said, like, it doesn't matter how much money you make, they just have this limit, like they'll say $6,000 for 2022. And so that's for everybody? The $6,000 or whatever limit they put out for the year is for everyone. But that's, again, one of those common misconceptions where people don't understand always that it's the accumulated amount over the years. So while it's $6,000 for 2022, you also have the $75,500 for the last, well, since 2009. So, and that, that it, it happens all the time. We get that question all the time where people come and they don't quite understand that because it is a, there's so many tools out there. There's so many different benefits to it that it gets a little confusing on it. Okay, that means, Kendra, as, as of 2022, let's say hypothetically, I haven't um, put any money into my own tax free savings account. As of 2022, I would have a contribution of 81,500 that I could put in if I've never contributed to my tax free savings. 
And then just to kind of bring us back a little bit to the tax savings, um, because I'm sure all of us deal at different financial institutions, the way CRA keeps track of what the contribution from is based on your social insurance number. So if let's say, again, hypothetically, if you had a tax free savings with island savings and a tax free savings at RBC, in addition to CIBC, it isn't as if you can have a tax free savings at each institution and each institution you can in, um, input $81,500. So it's all together, no matter which institution you're at, um, $81,500 max contribution per person. Okay, great information. Thank you. I wonder, does anyone know how an RSP can be used for a down payment on your first house? Fair enough. <laughs> um, so the RSP has this program in place that actually encourages first time home buyers to buy a house through saving savings with RSPs. And the reason that helps is it helps you get your down payment faster. Um, let's pretend like you're putting away, uh, you know, $1,000 a year, let's say $10,000 a year, DRSP. And let's say you pay 20% in tax. That means you're actually going to get $2,000 back on your tax return. You could take that $2,000 and put it into the RSP again, or put it into a tax-free savings and invest that. And now you've got $12,000 versus the, the $10,000 you put in. And all of a sudden you're building up your money that much faster by using the, the tax money you get back at the end of years by investing in the RSP. And you're able to actually, essentially the government says borrow the money from yourself without paying tax on it. And then you just pay it back over 15 years to yourself for your own retirement allowing you to keep putting off that tax payment until down the road. So it just allows you to save up that much faster for a house. And it's one of the really important, one of the primary ways I recommend a lot of my members in the right scenario, use the help try, try and save for their first home. They also have a similar program for education as well, where you can use your money from your RSP to help pay for education. And then again, pay yourself back without having to pay tax on it, as long as you pay it back within the prescribed period. I think I'm going to go on to the next slide here, guys. Yeah. When can you continue to RSP? So there is no age, minimum age required to open an RSP. And room is calculated um, as you earn income. An RSP can be set up and contributed up until this, your 71st year as long as you're Canadian and you've earned an income. So essentially, as you earn income over the year, you get 18% of your earned income that you can contribute to your RSP. So each year as you're making money, you're able to contribute 18% of that income, essentially. And, and if you don't contribute to it, that's, that's okay in a sense that you're gonna continue to have that room in the future. And sometimes we'll recommend to our members to, to put off if they're say at a, a lower income and they plan on going to an increased income in years to come. So it might make more sense to put off and to not use that RSP at a low income and use the tax-free savings instead. So I don't know if there's any questions on this slide, there might be something. It, it's essentially a tool that's usable for all at any age, as long as you're working. Yeah, sometimes I heard from people around me, they said, unless you are really rich, you don't need to have an RRSP because the interest rate is really small, especially in Canada. And then unless you need to have a lot of tax deduction, tax benefits, you don't need to join the RRSP. I don't know if it's true. And like I searched for the interest rate actually on the internet. <laughs> And it says that each average interest rate is ten percent. I think the ten percent is not bad. Ten percent is a pretty reasonable rate of return if you can get that year yeah. after year. That's impressive. Okay. Um, so, so, what I would 
say is that each person's situation is unique. Um, and an RSP does make sense for a lot of people. Uh, and if someone's referring to just the interest rates you're getting on, say, a savings account within a, a bank or, or a credit union, it's, it's not the only thing you can invest in. That's what you have to remember. There's, there's lots of other options out there for investments. Um, certain things do have minimums, like, like mutual funds will often have a bit of a minimum, uh, but you have to start somewhere. So you start saving in your saving, your RSP savings account and, and maybe some term deposits. And when you build yourself up to say $5,000, then you go into, if it makes sense for you and your scenario, potentially a mutual fund. And that's where you can see returns anywhere between 4% to 10%, depending on you know, what you're invested in and what your tolerance is with some of the, the, the highs and the lows that, that come with the mutual fund with investments. Uh, it, it's about a long-term goal though, and making sure that the plan suits you. I would say you need to, or I would recommend that you talk to a financial advisor that can actually make a recommendation for you and your situation and not base it off someone who's, who's being told a little differently for their situation. I think so. So how to contribute to a RRSP? Um, so yeah, this is the same scenario as the, the tax-free savings. You can determine your contribution room through either your MyCRA account. So that's the way you can look over all your, your tax-related information and you file your taxes and everything. Or you can actually call into the Canadian Revenue Agency, the CRA, and, and request uh, that they tell you how much room you have as well. Um, you, once you've done that, once you know how much room you have, then you can go visit your financial institution. You can speak to an advisor to set up a, an RSP account. Uh, you know, you can do it in many different ways. You can start by contributing by doing monthly contributions, something that's within your grasp, something that makes sense for you, whether that's on every payday, monthly, quarterly, uh, or, or you can actually just go in after you got your taxes sorted and you realized how much benefit there would be by contributing to an RSP, and you can make a one-time uh, contribution into it. As long as you do it uh, by March 1st of the, the following calendar year. So for example, the tax year of 2021 that we're going to have to go and file our taxes pretty soon here for uh, come January, you can make an RSP contribution for 2021 as long as it's done by March 1st of 2022. Uh, another note is that any of the unused contribution room can be carried forward and used in future years. I think I mentioned that earlier. If you don't use that room that you've been building up over the years as you've been earning income because you haven't yet contributed to the RSP, you're actually building that room up in your contribution room and you'll still get the use out of that. And then there's the, uh, the ability to open up a self-directed investing account for an RSP. So maybe you have gone to these things, you've learned about RSPs, you feel pretty comfortable about it and you'd like to do some of your own investing in the different stocks uh, bonds or mutual funds, you can actually go and do that yourself as well and open up an account on a contracted our uh, platform. Uh, we, we refer our members to Qtrade Securities. That's the, the partnership we have, but we don't actually, we're not able to offer any more advice past that. Uh, when you're doing self-directed, it truly is up to you to, to make your decisions at that point. So if you'd like to deal with an advisor and get that, that part of it, then we do recommend you. Anything else? For no. There we go. So we're about to hop into registered education savings plans, but just before we do, does anyone have any more questions about RRSPs? Okay. What is a registered education savings plan? Can you hear me okay? Is that better? Okay. 
So a registered education savings plan is a special savings account for parents who want to save for their child's education after high school. <laughs> okay, so why would you have an RESP? Uh, so, as Leah said, you save for your child's education and you get to do it tax free. Um, so, you, it's not like the RSP where you get to defer your, the taxes you're paying now, but any money that invested in the R, RESP, you're, you're making money on the investment and you're not paying tax on it during that time that it's sitting there within the RESP. So that's a good benefit compared to any other investment. The, one of the biggest benefits, I'd say the biggest benefit though, of having the RESP for your children uh, is, is the matching contributions and bonds from the government. So you get these grants from the government that will match 20% uh, a year up to $500. They also, for lower income, actually have additional grants as well. So if you're at a certain lower income bracket, they will add even more, another 10 to 20% of that. So it really does make a difference, even if you're making small contributions to that, that RESP, it does help your children for the future. It's a big difference, especially considering they offer the Canadian Learning Bond. So that's $500 just opening up that RESP will be contributed right away. And then it has an extra hundred dollars every year until the age of 15. So there's two thousand dollars we're doing essentially just coming in and opening. You wouldn't have to put any money in, but you get two thousand dollars. And on top of that, there's a there's a grant from the BC government it's called the BC Training and Education Savings Grant. So it's a one-time payment or gift of twelve hundred dollars. Uh, it has to be applied for between the ages of six and nine. So if you guys have kids out there and they're between those ages, I highly recommend you go. If you don't already have an RESP, you open up an RESP, you get your $500 grant or bond from the government, and you get $1,200 grant from the BC government as well. And if you can afford it, add in, add in a little monthly contribution, whatever it is, or just ask grandparents to, to put some money toward it. Any questions on that one? Keep moving on. So when can you contribute to an RESP? Really, you can contribute as soon as the child has been issued a social insurance number. Noting also that the parent would also have to have a social insurance number. The maximum RESP contrib contribution is a lifetime limit of 50,000 per beneficiary. Um, and that can be contributed to an RESP and kept up to 36 years. So you guys do the same little presentation. Like doing $25 a week can make a huge difference. Like just because of all the free, essentially free money the government is offering for you. Um, keeping in mind that they've got till that age, to uh, age 36 to use it, that can be used for a trade school, that can be used for um a university program a college program any any number of secondary education programs it, it's quite diverse and flexible that way so some people will think that it's only university it's not the case it's very usable and if the money wasn't used in that sense uh the the person who's actually putting the money in there can actually take that money out and, and, and use it as they see fit. There's no nothing stopping them from doing that. Or they can they can transfer it into their RSP. There's it, it's quite diverse and and offers a lot of benefit. So definitely worth, worth looking into with your children. And I'll just add to that, John, where if you were to look at contributing to an RESP, as you mentioned, the ability to be able to have the child either go to a, a university or a trade school. But it not only doesn't have to be just used for tuition, it can also be used towards books and living expenses on top of that. Yeah, after you show that you're enrolled, you can essentially use the money for whatever you want. So, uh, 
um, is this to show that you're you're in school and you are going to need extra time for for being in school. You know, it's very cool to use. And these ones are essentially just to the fans of advisors again. Um, that's how you can contribute to them. You have to have an advisor set up. These they're held in trust by a financial institution, essentially. And so they have to handle the grants and the bonds and whatnot, by the way. I'm making sure that when the money's coming out, it's going where it's supposed to go. That one keeps it simple. Um, yeah, that's where our put attached our emails on here. So if you do have questions or you feel like coming in to meet one of us, you're more than welcome. Uh, El Malone, islandsavings.ca, or Jay Parker, islandsavings.ca. And, and might open the floor to questions. Yeah. Um, so do you have to be a member of, of the First West Credit Union to be able to get advice from either of you? And how do you become a member? Just by opening a, an account? Yeah, so it, if we we're actually going into any advice, uh, we would want you to be a member with us for sure. But it is very simple to, to come in and open a membership here at um, Savings, um, book an appointment, same things that we talked about earlier, you know, bring some ID, date of birth and a sin, and you can open that account. With a credit union, you're actually buying into the membership. So it's just, it's $5 for shares and you become a member, you, you get voting rights on any major decisions. And then if you ever leave, you get that $5 back. The difference between a credit union and banks, is we're owned by our members. So that's why you have those shares. Whereas the bank is owned by its shareholders that influence the decisions that are made. So they're invested in them. On, on, to the stock market. So um, simple enough, but just book an appointment and, and we could likely open up the account. There is a credit check with uh, with our members. So you just have to have good standing credit and then and you'd be good to go. With side note, we actually offer uh, free checking accounts as well. So all your day-to-day -day banking is free, free e-transfers, unlimited transactions, um, just to make it that much more simple. So. Does anybody else have any questions besides me? <laughs> Please go ahead in the chat or by just speaking. Yeah, actually I have one. If I have an account in, I have some money in tax saving account or RRSP, and then if I wanna change the account to another bank, then what it would it be? Because the uh, RRSP, it, it gets a more interest rate as long as a, of the time I'm saving, right? So if I change the bank account to another bank, then you should start all over again, or the history continues from previous bank account? Sure. So thank you for the question. Yumi, what uh, if if you were looking to change financial institutions, your RSP and your tax free savings, you can transfer registered plans like your RSP and uh, tax free savings, um, you know, without uh, having to withdraw them. So let's say hypothetically you came into Island Savings, and from Island Savings we would initiate the transfer from your current financial institution. To island savings um, income. Oh, so I don't need to use draw the money from the uh, just to change the transfer the account. Oh, I see. Yeah, you just need to bring in your investment statements with you so that uh, when they can be sent off with the paperwork to reference the account. I see. Okay. Thank Does you. Note though that sometimes the financial institution that's holding that account might charge a smaller fee anywhere from $75 to around $100 I think. $100 to transfer a account? 50, 50 to 100 sometimes depending on the account and the size. So that's where I like to actually analyze your situation too. Like if it's a tax-free savings and we're at the end of the year, you could potentially just withdraw that money and then redeposit it because you have so much tax-free savings contribution room. And it's just going to come back to you in the new year anyway, which would save you that money. So it's worth the conversation before just doing it. But I'd recommend you bring in the investment statements so you can have uh, a proper analysis. Mm, I see. 
Okay, thank you. Yeah. Anybody else have any questions? Um, I just have a quick one. I think I've always wondered the difference between going to like a financial advisor and going to a bank or a credit union and getting advice from them. Do you take less of a profit uh, from the profit that I'm making off my investments if I get advice from you rather than a professional financial advisor? So when you're saying that you're meaning somewhere like go to Raymond James or... Okay. Yeah. 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 The the difference is generally minimal. The the way these accounts like usually you'd be talking about mutual funds in that scenario. Um so they likely have the same qualifications. We're paid on a salary basis. They probably be paid on a bit more of a commission basis or a fee-based basis. Uh, it depends on each investment firm and how they're set up that way. Uh, the, the actual expense of that investment is usually part of something called a management expense ratio within the mutual fund that helps pay for the fees. And those are generally universal across mutual funds. They vary up and down a little bit on how much they are, uh, but they're, they're on all mutual funds. And, and that's where that cost usually comes from unless it's an advisor who's literally saying that they're going to charge you a flat fee by the hour. Uh, you don't see that as often in the industry. Um, so yeah, not a huge difference. Uh, it just depends on, on which advisor you end up in front of really. Yeah. Down to it, in my mind, at least. And if you have anything to add to that. Just to add a little bit to that, Kendra, where, you know, Don and I are both licensed to sell mutual funds. So um, in that aspect, we, we, we have very competitive um, products and services that um, Edward Jones or Raymond James would have. But also in addition to that, we, we offer a very holistic approach in terms of, you know, not only are we looking at your investment needs, but your um, everything from your financial, you know, borrowing needs to your day-to-day -day banking needs to we embody that full picture so you know we we collaborate with a network of people so even if it's not let's say we're you know John and I will talk about your investments per se but we also collaborate with the team in here if you had questions about insurance needs or you find you know what I really I want to do some estate planning and some retirement planning so we also collaborate with a gentleman who from there, you know, we just add more brain power to the team. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, that sounds great. Thank you. That answers it really fully. Thank you. All right. Any more questions? Thank you for coming, everybody. And thank you so much for your time, John and Leah. That's really kind of you. Um, Financial Literacy Month. I'm not sure who made that up right before Christmas, but it, you know, we're supposed to be thinking about being smart with our finances a month before Christmas. But uh, thank you for helping us do that. <laughs> I couldn't have done it without you. Um, yeah. All right. Invite. Really appreciate it. Uh, happy to have the opportunity to to do this. So good. Um, Great. Hopefully, see you maybe next year in person. Yeah. Hopefully. Fantastic. All right. Okay. Expect the invite right, next year. Good night. Is it possible to have this presentation file by email? Yes, I should tell everybody that I am recording it. And no, it does take a day or so to just edit it a little bit. And it will be available on our website, the Vancouver Island Regional Library website under virtual programs portal. I'll, I'll send everybody the link to it. Okay. Oh, perfect. Hey, Kendra. I yep. might throw something out there. David had a question about RSP versus TFSA. If you're sending out a link, I have a, an option to a calculator online that you oh. can do that. And sometimes it's nice to go over with someone, but if you spend a couple extra minutes on it, you can probably kind of figure out all the, the ins and outs to it. And that, that can tell you uh, the direct benefit of, of one investment versus the other, generally speaking. So if, if you want, That's I can throw that in there. That sounds fantastic. Yeah, if you can email that to me, I'll send that out with the video link. Yeah, okay. that, that, that'd be great. Thanks. Yeah, no problem, Debbie. All right.
Thank you so much. Everybody have a good night. Thank you. Good night.